First of all, Allison, thank you for agreeing to do this HPT interview with me over Skype. Happy to be here. It's a thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Please indulge me a bit as I read a bit of an introduction for our viewing audience. Dr. Allison Rosette retired after many years as professor of educational technology at San Diego State University and continues to be a consultant in learning and technology. Allison works on needs analysis, technology-based learning, and engagement in a world with increasing contributions from technology-based learning and performance support. Allison says that she's fortunate because she gets to do things she never expected to do. For example, she, Nancy Lewis, and Jerry Cross debated in the ancient Oxford Union, the place where Muhammad Ali, John Kennedy, Ronald Reagan, and Winston Churchill did the very same. Her books include A Handbook of Job Aids from 1991, First Things Fast from 98, which won awards, Job Aids and Performance Support in 2006, co-authored with Lisa Schaefer, and Beyond the Podium in 2002, written with Kay Sheldon. And there was the ASTD e-learning handbook from 2001 with contrib contributions from Mark Rosenberg, Gloria Gary, Brandon Hall, Wayne Hodgkins, Tiagi, Bob Hoffman, Elliot Maisie, and many, many other authors. That's 45 chapters chock full of strategy, tactics, and case studies. Allison is a member of the Training Magazine's HRD Hall of Fame and currently serves on the board of the eLearning Guild and Chief Learning Officer. A few years back, she served on ASTD, which is now ATD's, International Board. Allison was also honored when ISPI selected her in 2001 as the Honorary Life Member, requiring the unanimous approval of two successive boards. And then again in 2011, when they bestowed upon her the wonderful Thomas F. Gilbert Award. Allison was also honored by ASTD for lifelong contributions to workplace learning and performance. Stunned when ASTD recognized her as a legend, she wondered how that happened. So let's explore how that happened by going back a little bit further. Can you share with us a little bit about your childhood, where you grew up and went to school, and about this prowess in ping pong that I read about, and then maybe segue into where you went to college and what you studied, et cetera? Of course I can, Guy. Um, well, I grew up in New York City. I went to the city public schools. Uh, I went to a place called Jamaica High School, which was gigantic and has now been shut down. Not sure quite why, but it was a big brouhaha in New York. Um, what did you, oh, you wanted to know about ping pong. Well, you know, the weather in New York's not so good. And my father liked both ping pong and pool, but our basement wasn't big enough. So we had this table in the basement which we would every six weeks or two months switch from pool to table to ping pong. We don't really call it ping pong. We call it table tennis, those yes. of us in the know. And we don't call them paddles. We call them bats. Mm -hmm. Just just if you, in case you wanted to know. <laughs> so I played all the time with my father and my brother. I'm sure my mother was probably cleaning or something or cooking. And... Um, you know, I wanted to beat them, which I only did when my brother was younger. Then, then not so good, not so good. But that, so that's how I got into table tennis. But it, it turned out to be extremely useful because many, many years later, I was on an IBM uh, advisory board. And they would gather us two or three times a year for wonderful meetings, deep, important boondoggles. No, just kidding. Uh, uh, one time they had a bunch of professors. I mean, there must have been 15 or 18 of us and probably two women and 15 men. And I was able to play table tennis against all those men successfully. I really, really, really liked it. I don't know if they did, but I did. Uh, so where was I? Uh, I went off to college. I went to a place called, oh, now this is kind of funny, I went to a place called Beaver College, which no longer is called Beaver College because you can't, search Beaver College because of the other associated names, which I never gave a thought to when I went off to college there. I had gone to a huge public high school. I wanted to go to a small, intimate women's college, which Beaver was at the time. It no longer is. Actually, I now serve on the uh, trustees, the board of trustees for Arcadia, formerly Beaver College, 
just outside Philadelphia. It's a wonderful, wonderful liberal arts school with all kinds of international this and that. So uh, I went to college there and I was an English major. And what the heck are you going to do with an English major? And you can either say uh, nothing or you could say everything. And I was fortunate enough to do everything with it. I realized that to me, literature and the liberal arts were sort of um, about communicating and understanding audiences, which seems to be very much at the heart of our work. And so then I took myself to the School of Public Communications at BU. And then I went on and did a doctorate at UMass in Amherst, lived in Northampton. That all changed my life. Let's see, what else did I say? Um, I guess that's kind of how I got there. So I got my doctorate at UMass. And what was I going to do, you know? I did a, my dissertation on the development of a, a curriculum for parents of deaf children to help them communicate more effectively with their deaf children. I'm not talking about sign language, although that would have been a good idea. But back in that era, it was still a big debate, no longer a debate. Um, but what interested me was the instructional design and the curriculum. And I read Ralph Tyler's Basic Principles of Curriculum, curriculum and Instruction. Remember, I was sitting in the Amherst College Library reading that. And I thought, this is brilliant. This is brilliant. And it's really the basis of Addy. Analysis, design, develop, implement, evaluate. Just some good questions. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And that changed my life. And so I eventually got a job at City University of New York. And they had focused on the development, uh, professional development of teachers. But for some reason, I don't remember the exact reason, this is the mid-70s, um, the, the, the teacher pool had dried up. Who knows why? You know, those things go up, they go down. Um, and so they said to me, you need to go find some new audiences. What about educators for adult education, adult basic skills, or hospital education? Or So that's kind of, they kind of threw me out of the nest. And I began working on projects in those kind of places so I could begin to figure it out. And I loved it. And it made so much sense. And unlike, I have to admit it, working with the teachers, which was like pulling teeth, these were audiences that loved systematic approaches to instructional design and that were driven towards accountability and transparency and customer focus. And so I kind of found myself, and fortunately, I, I was only at the ripe old age of, I don't know, 23, 24, 25. And that's the story that happened in um, New York City. Oh, and then they, the heat went out in my old building. I, I was at Lehman College, then I was at CCNY. The heat went out in the building. I was freezing. I was wearing mittens in this building, earmuffs. And this will interest you. Sitting across from me was Lou Simon, Paul Simon of Simon and Garfunkel's father. No kidding. He was a, a professor of reading. I was a professor of whatever they called it back then. I don't remember. Instructional design and technology. And he was, I mean, he was 100 years old, but he was right across. I thought he was. Probably he <laughs> wasn't. Um, sitting across from me, and the two of us were both complaining about how cold it was. And um, so I took applied for a job at San Diego State University for two reasons. I was cold. And I was in a bad relationship and I wasn't mature enough to know a good way to get out of that relationship other than zip off to the other side of the country. Thus, I found myself and my way to San Diego. So here I am, 40 plus years later in San Diego. It's probably 65 and sunny, although it, ha it has rained for the past couple of days and um, happy as a clam. Thank you so much for that background. Can you share with us some of the more interesting things that, that you've done in your career since arriving in San Diego, maybe with the university there or in your consulting practices uh, that you've uh, been engaged in over the years? Oh, I could go on. I could go on forever. But th there's no doubt that the most interesting part of my career has been the work with graduate students. I loved it. 
And that's really what I miss. Uh, I retired from the university. I still do the occasional consulting. Um, that was wonderful. There's still in my, I mean, there isn't a day that goes by where somebody doesn't pop into my email uh, or up on Facebook. Uh, my gosh, I had a walk this past weekend with uh, Antonia Chan, who was probably my student 15 years ago. And that isn't far back. Uh, and she was a Fulbright. She's a Chinese Panamanian who has been working for Amway for 15 years and developing their international training systems. Um, I still have, those were wonderful relationships. I got as good as I gave and it was a delight. Um, consulting. Oh, I, I was just looking at a list of those things. I wouldn't even know where to begin with all that. Um, redesigning sales training for a global real estate company. Uh, looking at evaluation systems in a global learning company, a consulting company. Um, design, uh, developing uh, instructional designers for, again, a very large... I worked mostly in very large organizations. I'm not sure why that was, but it was. Uh, government agencies, uh, security agencies... The Internal Revenue Service was a major client for years, and it was great because we were able to put our graduate students in it, too. So it wasn't like the university was my right hand and the consulting was my left hand. They were very intertwingled, and I was blessed. I mean, it was good for the university and for my classes because I actually was up to date on what was going on in the world and what the challenges were and what those folks were going to want to hire and so that was good. It was good for my students. And, of course, it was good for me, too, obviously. Um, exam, so uh, I, what would be an oh, uh, working with a, a large Canadian firm that uh, financial services that acquired a bunch of uh, banks in the U.S. and putting together an online home for instructional design and performance technology so that they would have similar references and standards to bring them together, those that kind of work. I said that, uh, so that, that that gives you enough of a sense of it. It just about, you know, whenever I describe this work, which I must admit is not that often every day nowadays, uh, that's why I went back and looked at the list. Um, I thought about um, how people will often say to me, I have to get something off my screen there. How people will often say to me, um, what do you mean you worked with the Coast Guard? What do you mean you worked in financial services? What do you mean you worked at the zoo? You don't know anything about any of those things, do you? And, of course, the answer is not so much. <laughs> Although, after I finished a ton of work with uh, art conservation, you know, the conservation of paintings, photographs, feathers, leather, et cetera, et cetera, for the Getty Conservation Institute, and I worked with them for many, many years. I actually did know a lot about conservation, but not how to, not at the bench, but rather the the context, the environment. So, you know, we it's about it's about it's about the 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 processes we use to solve problems really and to execute on on systems. To, to, to solve those problems. And I, I don't think it matters much whether you're applying it to a zoo or uh, um, art conservation in London or Brazil or um, um, local training and the local community colleges where I did a little bit of work. Well, thank you so much. See, there was a lot for you to tell us and share with us. And uh, that's very interesting, your, your background. Let me shift gears a little bit and ask you, can you share with us uh, where you first got exposed to HPT, human performance technology, or evidence-based practices for performance improvement, or however you refer to it? Right, that's fair, and I think that's well put, Guy. Um, I went to work at San Diego State, and <laughs> I'm embarrassed to admit it, but my first, I was given three classes to start. I mean, it's a state university, and it was a pretty bruising teaching load. Um, and I think class, they were called, I'm making this up now, but 
educational technology, advanced educational technology and instructional design. And I looked at those and I thought, I read the descriptions and I thought, what the hell? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And, and, you know, it was pretty much good luck. Have at it. Um, which I must admit now I would probably say, Oh my God. But then I thought, okay, (laughs) climb that down. And I wanted to, and when I started working with students in, in, in our program, our graduate program, um, it was a master's level program at the time. I thought, well, uh, let me look and see. I wanted to figure out where to focus my career. And I didn't want, I, what I noticed was the students would do their projects and they'd sort of put their fingers in the air and they really didn't have robust strategies for analysis. So I decided to look at the literature. And I looked at the literature and I looked back at John Dewey. And one of the first things John Dewey said was talk to the students, see what they need. This was considered absolutely radical. It had always been driven by subject matter experts, right? And they don't mean subject matter experts probably the way we do, but it had always been driven by ancient historical wisdoms. Nobody said to the students, what do you need to go about your lives or or to satisfy your heart and your belly? So uh, he was a total radical. So my first exposure in trying to be useful, which is what I wanted to be, took me to analysis, where it all starts. And I didn't get what I needed from the literature. Not sufficiently, not sufficiently. And I, you know, there were great people. ISPI gave us some great people. Mager and Kaufman and Markle. They were, it was good, it was a start. But I gave that to my students and they still said, I'll put my finger in the wind. So I just, I started writing in that area. And that's when I gave birth to this book, this book, Training Needs Assessment, which I was looking at this morning. I hadn't looked at it in a long time. And I thought, oh, my God, that's really something to have to dig yourself into. Um, but it, that's so that's why I gave birth to it, because my students, I was placing them at the zoo on projects like creating medium sized animals for trips to the veterinarian in the San Diego Zoo. And we needed a robust method for our students to figure out what goes in and what doesn't go in. Where do they focus their attention? These people who are crating these medium-sized animals that could rip their throats out or that they could hurt, um, they, they don't want to spend an hour on this. And then there was the question, of course, which we always get to, is what do they need to know by heart, by heart and mind and belly, and what can they reach for when they have to do the crating, which isn't every day. It's not like you have specialists in crating. You know, mm-hmm. the zookeepers do many, many things. So um, that's kind of what got me to where I studied. And you also wanted to know about my influences. So I actually found this interesting to think about. I hadn't thought about it in a while. Joe Harless influenced me. Uh, Ken Blanchard in, influenced me. He actually was my professor at UMass, and he's out here in San Diego. Ron Zemke, Tom Gilbert, Gloria Geary, Susan Markle, Don Norman, Roger Addison, Paul Harmon. What a smart guy Paul Harmon is. B.J. Fogg, and I could go on. But those are just a few of the people who influenced me. And um, so I'll stop right there. Well, thank you. No, that's good. It'll help point people coming into the field, uh, Uh resources and and folks and their writings. Um, Maybe they're on videos. And uh, yes, that's exactly what we're looking for. Well, let me shift gears then again um, and ask you if you were to give a 30 second elevator speech on what you currently do or what you have been doing. If you're at a cocktail party and somebody says, Allison, what do you do? What would you have said? Oh, what would I have said or what do I or say? What would you say now? What would I say now? This is what I do. Can you see? <laughs> Take care of your dog. Yeah, can, Roxy, can you say, say hello? Can you see her? Yes. She's pretty spectacular. Uh, her name is Roxy. She's uh, two and a half years old. She's a Labradoodle, 26 pounds, caramel colored, and um, hypoallergenic. And uh, my my partner is 
allergic to everything. And um, so I do a lot of her. I walk her. I, th- I think about how to make her life nicer. Um, she gives me lots of exercise, too. So that's one thing I do. I do Roxy. The other thing I do is I exercise a lot. Many steps at the gym. We go to the Y. I go to the Y. I'm sure people are not are not terribly interested in all that. But I also do the occasional project or speech. So, um, you know, I take on a project like somebody will call up and say, you've done work in mobile. Um, we're interested in leadership development. We would like to look and think at the, about the issue of how can we use mobile to augment all the money we spend on leadership development to maybe actually turn it into daily practice. So how do you blend leader development, you know, classes and coaching with online resources and performance support and reminders and groups and social? And so that's the kind of thing I do occasionally take on. And I'll look at some of the examples of things that exist and, and, and review them and then work with the organization. Uh, I've done a little bit of work recently uh, in instructional design skills for global instructional designers who have some of the most challenging work where they're trying to, to, where they are building development programs so that people can tell what's appropriate and not appropriate on social media. I mean, this is very heavy for some of these very large organizations. And so their instructional designers have to be up to date in Kansas City, uh, beyond Kansas City, up to date in the Middle East, up to de- date in Europe, up to date in Africa. So many languages, many cultures, many, 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 many challenges. Um, what, and I still occasionally get brought in to do keynotes on going beyond training, uh, expanding from classroom into performance support and uh, ecosystems, environments that'll help leaders be better leaders, help, uh, I don't know what to call them, associates who screen screens, make better decisions about what should be in and what should be out. Um, So that kind of thing. I still do the occasional speech. I still do the occasional project. Just not a ton of it. Selective. I'll do the speech in a place I really want to go, like Dublin. I just, I wasn't long ago in Dublin. Um, Where else? I'd like to go uh, back to South Africa. Mm -hmm. Hello, anybody? (laughs) Like that. Well, hopefully that dream comes true or that wish comes true. Let me shift here. Uh, Is there, can you share with us your current focus as a lifelong learner? Is there anything in particular that you are now exploring perhaps for the first time, or maybe just going deeper in something that you were familiar with? Uh, Or are you writing anything anymore? What can you share with us? Those are fair questions. Um, I've actually been looking recently at the whole question of influence. And the reason for it is I think about how starting in the late 70s, I would say, you can't just chain, train the sales men and women. You have to train the sales managers. Nothing that we do can be done unless we work with the leaders and the managers because they listen to them, not the class they took November 17th. So one of the things I've been looking at is how can I use influence, the literature on influence, um, the literature on I've also updated my work on infomercials. Uh, ISPI might remember me doing a uh, late night presentation on uh, infomercials, closing keynote of some conference we had back. I don't even remember where we were. It was nice, though. Um, So I've been doing some work on that. Um, I guess the thing that interests me now is I use a lot of technology, but I'm not so interested in writing about technology. I'm not the most up to date on technology now. Um, not bad, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna win any awards on that. Um, but what I'm interested in is how we can push the rock up the hill. 
in regards to changing the things we've been nattering about forever. And will I write? Yeah, probably shorter formats. I don't think the world needs another book from me, much as I love this book. And First Things Fast, I love that book. Didn't love, I don't love them all, but I, lo- I love those two. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Well, let me shift again to uh, our language in the profession. Um, my question is, is there a favorite or perhaps a less than favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us because perhaps you hear it being used or read about it and, and people have misconstrued it or twisted it somehow. Is there some phrase that uh, you can give us your definition? For? The, yes, I, I will do that. And I, I actually like it. I once wrote an arc, article called Disambiguating Whatchamacallit. Disambiguating Whatchamacallit. You can probably find it. I didn't try to find it, uh, but I did write it. And, and my whole point was, there's so much blah, blah, blah in our field. And so I thought about doing analysis, doing the definition here. I decided, no, I've written about it enough. You all can find that. But what I'm going to do is maybe take a little bit from my job aids and performance support book, which I still like, has a gazillion examples, some of them very funny. Let me see if I can find page, I wrote it down, page Two to four. Okay. People say, so I worked in two areas significantly. Uh, Analysis, you know, the beginning of the beginning, and um, performance support, or what you can wrap around it to actually turn maybe ideas into action. So here's my definition of performance support, and then I'll dig into it a little bit. Performance support, <clears throat> it, performance support is a helper in life and work. Performance support is a repository for information, processes, and perspectives that inform and guide planning and action. Okay, so I very carefully put that together. And now when I say a, a helper in life and work, I think it's maybe easier for us to bring it into learning centers or in training departments or HR organizations or whatever we're calling it. Um, Performance units, are we? Mm, Not so much, I think. If we start with life, not just work. So for example, um, it's not just useful to people at work. It's useful to retirees or pre-retirees in figuring out, am I ready for retirement? It's also useful as a checklist, for example, in thinking about what do I need to put in the suitcase for a trip to the South Pacific, right? You don't need to go to school on these matters. Performance support. So it's a helper. Yes, at work, of course. It's a helper in what do I do if I get a chemical splash? There's posters up that do that. But it's also an immense helper in life. And when people see how helpful it is and how much they already rely on it, their to-do list, for example, in, in life, they might insinuate it more into work. Okay, so helper in life and work. Repository for three things, information, processes, and perspectives. So there's information, what's the code, what's my password, there's processes, how do I secure the data in the computer, And then the piece that I added um, is perspectives so that it'll remind you what the standards are for doing something. Example, I was always impressed when at IBM and at the back of their, you know, they had a name thing, name tag or whatever the heck it was called. You know, it was laminated thing on the back of it. They would put different things. But one of the things they had on the back of it was you've just met with a customer Did you do these things? Did you meet these standards? And they had five or six attributes. I just thought that was great. And let me give you another really good example, Motorola. I thought this was great. I was teaching a class at Motorola one day, and I was walking around behind people. We were in a, I don't know, sort of a U-shape, but it was, I forget. I'm sure it has a name. I forget the name. But on the back of name cards were like eight attributes of an effective student 
in a class. All right? You personalize it. You take notes and you apply it to what you're going to do. You ask questions. You refer. You know, I don't have to. You mm -hmm. can figure out what those things would be. But it's such a good darn reminder. And that's what I mean by perspectives. Could you send people to how to go to class? You know, what's a good student? You could. Who's going to remember it? Okay. And finally, informs and guides. Informs and guides. Um, so what did I say here? Uh, let's see. It informs and it guides. So again, it gives you the basic information, but it also nudges you in the right direction. It's a coach. It's a guide. It's always there. It's never exhausted. It can even deliver an attitude adjustment. And here's an example from the book that I loved. I found it in The New Yorker. A writer described encountering an instructive note about how not to have a breakdown when the copy machine breaks down. So, item four on the list, taped to the machine, reads, please try not to take it personally when the machine has its problems. It's just a machine. In other words, please don't bang, beat, bruise, or otherwise abuse it. It won't help. End quote. That's what I mean about guides. And that's what I mean about performance support that goes beyond just, you know, the list of your past, list of your passwords, steps to secure data, steps to make an iced tea or a latte or whatever. So, uh, let me say one more thing about it. Remember I said the end of it was to guide planning and action. Typically, we think about performance support to guide action. How to put the gas in your tank. In what order? The car, first the Costco card, then the credit card, then the step, 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 step. Um, it's not just action, it's also planning. And that's, in the early definition of job aids, Joe Harless highlights procedures, action, and information. What Jeanette Godier Downs and I did in our 1991 Handbook of Job Aids, which I don't even have down here, um, we expanded it to include more cognitive definitions. In other words, things to keep in mind as you're, I don't know, packing your suitcase. Uh, things to keep in mind as you're trying to decide whether or not to get a divorce. Why did I even think of that one? But in other words, just uh, let me see if I can think. I'm sure I have some good example. Consider burger assembly. Burger assembly you know, beef burger or beyond burger mm -hmm. assembly is an example of a, of a sidekick performance support. It's there as you're doing it. But a planner performance support would make sure that the place that you were ready to actually serve burgers to your guests, right? It helps you put things together, helps you plan. So is that enough definition of performance support that is excellent so. that that uh, hopefully people will understand that performance support is not a new concept it's just no. made it's just made easier perhaps because we all have a smartphone or a tablet uh, at our side the, the sidekick um but uh, yes thank you for that so where i would like to go next is explore some of the people who you've worked with or who have influenced you. Uh, we talked about this before we hit the record button and you are you have a story to share about Mark Rosenberg. What can you share with us? Well, oh, I could tell a lot of stories about Mark Rosenberg. Please. He's, he's such a picky eater, but no, I'm not going to, that's, I, well, I have actually, a, and I'm, I've tried to decide whether it was a good idea to tell the story, but first I'm going to talk about why I picked Mark Rosenberg. Um, Mark and I were on a very early board. Well, it was early in my career. Maybe it's not early for ISPI. Uh, it was probably back when it was called NSPI, and we were at Diane Dorman's house in Bloomington, Indiana. Beautiful gardens. Oh, my God, what a talented garden person. And um, it really was wonderful being on the board with Mark I, and Diane and the other people on the board, too. But especially Mark. Because he was not, he, he's different. Mark is very different. He's, most people are either very strong tactically or very strong strategically. But Mark 
can do it both and he can move back and forth with fluidity. So yeah, he's good about vision and he can see where the field is going and he has he's full of ideas about that. But then he can actually, and he worked at AT&T for a million years, he can actually sell those ideas to them and then build a performance support tool years before anybody else did. I mean, one a tangible one that people actually used to do the work. Imagine it. So that's why I picked Mark, because he's strategic and he's tactical. He's not just talk. He goes after something. He goes, he goes after it, does it. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to tell a story about Mark. I, 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 so I was doing some consulting for Mark. I, I don't remember what we were working on because we, over the years, did some several things. But So I flew from San Diego to New Jersey. And I don't, I, haven't, I don't know what I was going to do, but he, what he said to me is, we're going to get, go get a cup of coffee, and I'm going to, we're going to talk about the whole day. Of course, we already knew it because both of us are insane planners, but he wanted to review with me what we had agreed to, and then he said, but I'm going to be disappearing in a moment because he and his wife, Harleen, you know this is true, Mark, he and his wife, Harleen, were working on fertility. And he had to go home to work on fertility. And I had to stay at AT AT&T, I don't remember where, Bedminster maybe, somewhere, while he worked on fertility. That's my Mark Rosenberg story. And you know it's true. And by the way, the fruits of his labors are now, I I was at Brian's bar mitzvah, and now I think he's, I don't know how old he is, 35? But it's been a while, huh, Mark? And it was successful. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the consulting. The, yes, the, the project. I'm, yes. Well, Allison, thank you so much for agreeing to participate in this video interview. As uh, a final question, can you can you sh- do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for people that are new to the field, whether they're young or middle aged or older? Um, related to performance improvement or instructional design, what's your guidance for them? Mm, Listening, um, curiosity, endless curiosity. People, to this day, I'll go into a restaurant and ask, and if they do a particularly good job on the service, I'll ask how they got there, how they got skilled in that. And um, curiosity, really, about about people in their work, people in their lives, people in their work, their contexts, why it works and why it doesn't. Ask a lot of questions about why. Um, and then I guess the other thing I always said to grad students was that plus learn how to write. It's still very important. And autocorrect, oh, that will not get it done for you. And the fact it could get you in some serious trouble. Allison, thank you for that. And again, thank you so much for sharing with us today your wisdom and insights. <laughs> Pleasure, Guy. Nice being with you. Thank ciao, you. Ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.